them in the chat or you should be able to unmute and shout something out. It's a small enough group that uh, that shouldn't be an issue. So uh, right. Don, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, welcome to the IEEE Buena Ventura Computer Society. Um, I'm the chair of the, of the chapter society, I guess, for, for uh, the computer uh, society. Um, we do have uh, coming up tomorrow, uh, a mixer event over in Westlake Village at uh, the what's called the Hub. It, all the information is available at the main IEEE Point of Ventura site. So all you have to do is Google IEEE BV, and it should take you to that site pretty quickly. Um, if I find the link quick, quickly, I'll I can throw it in the chat, but. Um, um, that's the main event that's happening in the next, uh, this week. Um, and today's talk is by Carl Geiger, um, what to know about work. And I'll, uh, uh, let Carl take it from here. All right. Thanks, Don. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone is well. Um, I see most people are muted. So if you have a comment, I think we want to put that in the chat. Is that right, Darren? Uh, they they that. should be able to unmute themselves if they if they want to, but uh, okay. the, I will also be watching the chat to see if there's any okay. questions that come up. Well, we do have a small enough group. Um, yeah. So so I will do the uh, most of the presentation, and when I, I will pause at a couple of places to take questions before going on, um, in case there's any questions, we can do this more interactively uh, with a smaller group than with a larger group today. So uh, can you guys see my slide presentations? Tyler, nod your head if you can. There should be a big slide. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Excellent. <laughs> so this, uh, this presentation is what to know about work. Uh, I, I have been a, a manager for a long time in the computer science, computer technology field. And I was at a party quite recently, and there were a number of uh, folks, what happened here? Uh, uh, there were a number of folks at the party who were about to go into the workplace or uh, were in graduate school and also about to go into the workplace. And in chatting with them, it was, it was astonishing to me uh, what their expectations were. And so since I have been a hiring manager in the past, I thought it would, it would be a, a kindness to put out, uh, let's see, slide two, here we go. A kindness to put out some information uh, to my fellow engineers um, who are going from school or directly from school into the workplace because it can be a little bit bewildering at times. So uh, we have a, a wonderful working environment in the state of California and the information that you're going to hear me talk about today is primarily based, uh, from my experience, both as an employee in multiple different workplaces and also as a manager in uh, and under California employment law. If you're in a different state or especially a different country, the laws here uh, will not necessarily apply. And uh, I think the key thing here is this disclaimer. Um, I'm not offering legal advice. If you, are, if you are interested in getting legal advice about your employment situation, you should consult with an employment lawyer or your private lawyer. There are a number of different legal frameworks which control how employment works in the state of California. There's different rules and regulations for uh, state employees, for school employees, for private employees, for employees at not-for-profit organizations and so forth. I've worked at not-for-profits, I've worked at uh, universities, I've worked at for-profits, I've worked at the state, and I've volunteered in a lot of different locations as well. So what you're getting here is somewhat anecdotal uh, review of things that I have noticed and things that I wish someone had told me when I entered the workforce way, way long ago, back in the mists of time in the early 1980s, when I was a little baby hacker just coming out of the university. So with that said, 
please, please review the disclaimer. This is, this is the story here. I'm not offering you legal advice. Um, take this stuff with a grain of salt. Just take it as what it is. This is a hard earned experience. And if you do need legal help with your employment situation, do seek a lawyer. All right. Let's talk about what it is to be at a company. Um, I'm gonna use the word firm, uh, which is a very generic term. There are a lot of different kinds of firms, but basically the idea is they are all a group of people who are paid to do work at some point. Um, I don't really consider working for a volunteer organization like the IEEE or my wife volunteers for the Ventura County Animal Shelter. Those really aren't firms because they don't pay their employees. Um, there are a number of different types of firms with a number of different, as I've noted earlier, uh, legal frameworks under which they operate and how they treat their people and have to treat their people according to the law. But the general idea here is if you have a bunch of people working together, um, you're effectively at a firm. And what that firm does is extraordinarily important to how your workday goes and how things move and are planned and brought forward. So let's just keep that in mind that we're talking very generically and that the rules for operation inside a different firm uh, will be different depending upon what segment of industry that you are working in. Um, most of the more interesting uh, times I had working at various firms was at a public sector corporation, Amgen Incorporated, and that was quite an experience. Um, the uh, amount of freedom compared to, say, working at a, a uh, uh, university or in the, in the government uh, jobs is quite, quite wonderful and quite uh, exhilarating. But it was also uh, something of, uh, okay, you got to really pay attention here. And so I'm going to base a lot of this presentation on working for a publicly owned company where things can be a lot of fun and things can be a little less secure than you would normally have experienced if you've just been in school all along or you've just been working in the public sector for a government agency. Schools are very like government agencies, especially if they're well, a state-run school like a CSU or a UC. So anyhow, we're talking about firms. So treat this as a generic idea. So, so what is a, a firm has to exist? And the, the, the way a firm exists is that it has to pay its people, which means you gotta, you gotta earn money, you gotta bring money in. And so whether or not a firm is private or publicly held or paid for by the government or whatever, uh, there's, there's a definite, need at the upper management levels, there's a definite focus on bringing in a stream of revenue in order to keep things running. And it's not just paying the employees to do work, you also have to consider rent for the buildings and payment for the electricity and the equipment and the tools and the services and all the things that you use in order to complete the tasks uh, that the firm needs to get done. The point of a firm is to complete some task which is of value somehow, which is why you get money out of it. If you aren't getting money for your work, well, you're doing chores at home or you're doing volunteer work or you're working on a hobby. Still very enjoyable, but it's not a for pay work. And firms need to have some sort of revenue stream in order to stay alive. It's like breathing, it's like food, it's like water. There's, there's a lot to be said by paying attention to who pays for the firm's services, which tells what product the firm puts out. Um, you, would, you would not expect a firm which say makes tires to be interested in the same sorts of things as a firm which makes say software. But uh, some of the managerial structures are the same, but nonetheless, uh, the, the people who buy tires are very different than the people who buy software. And who the firm's customers are, whether or not the customers are paying for it, uh, depend, uh, determines how the firm operates and behaves. So when you join a firm, you need to pay attention to who the customers are. 
And that is a very key point. So for example, <clears throat> your line of business for your firm is what does it make and to whom does it sell it? That's pretty easy to find out. When I worked at the University of Southern California, we had three lines of business, basically. One was the education of students, both graduate and undergraduate. The second was doing research on contract. And that was research on contract either to private industry or to the federal government. The federal government pays for an awful lot of research money, mostly through the National Institutes of Health and through the Office of Naval Research and through the DOD. Um, also some through the Department of Energy. But by and large, who pays the bills directs what work gets done because you have to satisfy the customer. Um, the other major revenue source for the University of Southern California was its hospital system. And the hospital system was used to both train physicians and nurses, but it was also used as a revenue source uh, to support the hospital's operations in which case the hospital segment of the university was very involved with contending with uh, the insurance companies and the medical firms and the payors. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of complication that goes on there. And it's only gotten worse over the, the several decades since I left the university. But you can also look at any other, co any other company out in the real world. Um, you know, SpaceX makes rocket ships and they make internet. And now with their satellites, they're now beginning to offer ground to satellite telephone service worldwide. That fits very nicely with their other business plan. I mean, most of the rocket launches that you see from SpaceX are actually being done on behalf of SpaceX's satellite network. If you take a look at a company like Amazon and you read through their balance sheet or you read through their financial statements, you will learn that Yes, Amazon is not a tech company in part. Most of Amazon and Amazon's origins are as a retail company. They sell stuff to people. They're very good at it. Their retail side of the business is in competition with the other major retailer in the United States. And that retailer is Walmart. Interestingly, Amazon makes as much profit in its retail segment, its retail line of business as Walmart does which is only about two to 3% of sales. Retail is a very tough business. Amazon makes almost all of its money by selling its cloud services through Amazon Web Service. Um, they actually have a far greater margin and that actually is probably keeping the company afloat right now. So it's very important when you join a firm that you ask about their line of business and you also want to ask, especially when you're interviewing, see a little guy there, you want to ask, who's your real customer? It's very important to know who the real customer is. Um, when I was at Amgen, the real customers were not doctors, even though Amgen had sales representatives, they're called pharmaceutical sales reps, visiting doctors. But the real customers are the pharmacies that bought our drugs and then gave them to patients. The, the drug business in the United States is messed up. It's very different from country to country. But the important thing to know is who is the customer? And it's very simple. The customer is the one who gives you money in exchange for your product. Everything else is marketing. Um, so if you are going on an interview, you want to be sure to ask your hiring manager, what exactly and who exactly are the payers and what are they buying from the company? And that will help you gauge how the firm operates internally. Really good example, as long as we're talking about line of business. This is Microsoft's line of business uh, for the last, I think it's uh, from 2012 to today. Microsoft changed its entire business structure in 2014 when Satya Nadella took over the company from Steve Ballmer. And what Microsoft did was it ditched all of the lines of business like gaming and like consumer sales of software in favor of three major lines of business, which you can see on the screen there. 
They sell software for installation on computers. They offer cloud services so you could run your Microsoft software in the cloud on their cloud. And they also offer uh, what are called enterprise, enterprise resource planning services, something like an SAP. Um, and their com the competitors in the ERP business are companies like SAP, the big German firm, or Oracle, or Salesforce. And their competitors in the home off in the home business are Apple because Apple is competing with their operating systems. And their cloud business doesn't really have a whole lot of competition except for Amazon and Google. Um, it's a place to run your code in the cloud. As you can see from this chart, um, it's been a very good a very good thing for them to focus on those three areas of business. And then all their previous businesses were brought in and then they were put towards one or more of those particular business areas. I mean, they still develop software. It's how they sell it. Their line of business is now Microsoft 365. They rent their software. They don't sell it anymore. And that was a very smart move because nobody really wants to own software. What they want to do is use it. There's really no point to having the stuff if you don't use it. And so by renting the software, it's kind of like a gym membership. Okay, we're getting your money. If you go to the gym or not, that's your problem. But nonetheless, this allowed them, if you look at the, I think it's the gray bar, um, you will see that their, their sales, sorry, their revenue based on their software business increased tremendously when they switched to that model. So once again, very important when you join a firm, doesn't matter what firm it is, government, private, public, Ask what the line of business is, ask who the customers are, ask how the company gets paid. How does it get its money? Okay, enough about the firm in general. Firms operate because they have people to do the work for them. And what firms do is they organize their work into units. There are various divisional units within a company and they're responsible for different different functions of the company. Some of those functions are internal. Some of those functions are external. Sales and marketing, external. Doing finance and management, internal. Product development is internal, but it's focused on you know, producing something for the, for the output. The way firms organize themselves, and this is just the way it is, is they have a set amount of work to do, they figure out how they estimate the management teams estimate how much effort it's going to take to get it done. Then they make an estimation in terms of work hours or man hours or person hours, whatever metric you want to use. It's going to take so long to get this amount of work done. Do we need a person? Do we need to create a position to satisfy that piece of work? Yes, we do. They will create a position. They will put money behind it. In other words, they will budget for it and make sure that they can pay someone. And then they go out and they hire someone to fulfill that position. The important thing to remember is, and this is one of the things I heard at the party when I was talking to the students who were about to enter the workforce is, well, they thought it was their job or they thought that they somehow owned the job. You don't own the job. It's the firm's job. You are employed to fulfill the requirements of the position the firm has. OK, so you hear a lot of people saying, well, it's my job, this it's my job, that. Well, technically, you're responsible for getting the job done, but you don't own the job. And remember, you're being paid to do this job. And that's a really important distinction. They have to pay you to come to work. Right. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't show up. I've been in so many meetings where people were saying, well, I come to work because the people are great. No, you don't. You come to work because you got paid. If you didn't get paid, most people wouldn't show up. They would just be ghosts. They would completely ghost the thing. But my point is here that the, the firm owns the job. The firm owns the position. The firm has need of your services to get those things done. And managers, managers are the people who are in the upper part of the pyramid. And supposedly they have experience in, with this particular type of work. And they're the ones who decide how many people they need and whether or not they need to fill out a position. That's actually a lot trickier than it sounds. So despite the cartoons of the pointy haired boss and Dilbert, yeah, they, they do look like they're doing stupid things that you don't understand, but they're operating under a different set of rules. And 
the set of rules that they are operating under has to do with being able to allocate the limited amount of manpower, person work hours that they have at their availability to get a certain amount of work done that they've been tasked to oversee and get done. It's actually a very difficult job. And generally you wanna have someone who's been experienced in that particular work in order to do that managerial job because they have a very good idea of how much effort it takes to do. The other important takeaway from this chart is that everyone has a boss. Your boss has a boss, his boss has a boss, all the way up to the CEO. And in, a, in most companies, even the CEO has a boss. There's this thing called a board of directors who guides and controls companies, especially public companies. If you have a city, let's say my local city of Moore Park, the, the city employees report up through the city manager and the city manager reports to the city council and the city council reports to the voters. So everybody has a boss. Um, that's you know how things go up and down and the messages can get muddled going up and down, but nonetheless, there are there's actual a, a chain of responsibility which goes up and down and you're part of it, whether you start at the bottom and work your way up or whether you insert yourself at, into a new position at a different firm. Everybody's got a boss and it will be that way for you know every time as long as you're employed somewhere. So now you wanna get hired into one of these positions. <clears throat> First, let me say that your technical skills are table stakes. It's, they're hiring to, to find someone who can complete the technical requirements, whether it's programming or spreadsheeting or managing a financial portfolio or doing project management whatever, or managing other people, okay? The technical skills that go with that are table stakes. It's assumed that you know what you're doing. I've seen, and I have actually been guilty of this, focus too entirely much on the technical side of the job interview and not enough on the personality side. The personality side is actually far more important, and I will get to that in a minute. The second, the second thing that bosses are looking for is, is this person going to be reliable? And I've had to fire people who were not reliable. They were not coming into work or they came into work drunk or they came to work such that they were hungover or un incapable of doing the day's work at a reasonable pace. Um, in, in those cases, you know, that, that person was just not working out for the firm. They were not able to fulfill the requirements of the position. And then the real key thing, the thing that, that, that gets overlooked a lot is you have to be able to work with the other people in the company. And that is the most key thing possible. If you're very, very good technically, but you're extremely unpleasant, no one will want to work with you, number one. And number two, um, you won't be able to learn much about what's going on in the firm because you really do need to talk to people. Um, I, you know, I was raised as an engineer and I know many engineers have this, you know, it's my work and I'm just going to stick myself and keep my heads down and just do my job. You can do that to focus and get stuff done, but do spend some time interacting with your fellow employees. And I will talk more about that later. You would be astonished at how much you could learn from somebody else. The other point uh, I would like to make on this slide is when you speak with people, be Deliberate, careful, and slow in your speech. Choose your words carefully. Once upon a time, I had one of my employees come to me and say, I noticed that you talk very carefully, and I noticed you talk especially carefully on the telephone. And I said, yes. And he said, why is that? And I said, well, here's why. Because we're a multinational corporation, and when I talk to someone in Japan or Belgium or India or even within the United States, I need to be extraordinarily clear in what I say and extraordinarily careful in how I say it so they understand because not everybody's language, first language is English. My first language is English and my first language is American English. And it's very easy to run over the words and talk in a slurred way and you can't really understand what the hell someone is saying. Um, the other thing that you have to remember is that if you are using, say, a sports analogy, you can't. You can't say the whole nine yards or, you know, hit a home run. If you're talking to somebody in, say, India or, you know, Saudi Arabia, because they don't know what that means, because the sports that they play in their countries are very, very different. 
Oh, I'm pretty sure you could probably get away with making a soccer analogy. So when you speak to your colleagues, take your time, slow down, you know, speak clearly, and then listen very carefully to what they have to say, because they may not grasp that they need to talk clearly and deliberately to each other. If you do that, um, you'll be known as a good communicator and you'll get high marks on your reviews for being a good communicator. And people appreciate that. They appreciate that you take the time to talk to them carefully. The other thing to know about your workplace now that you're that you're in the door and you're working along with your people is that you should look around and see what the firm's business cycle does on an annual basis. Um, every company has some sort of annual cycle. Most companies that are publicly held, you know, held with, by stockholders, their annual cycle revolves around a financial year, which goes from January to December, basically based on the tax year. If you work for the federal government, you will know, and it's kind of fun, the federal government's funding year begins on the 1st of October. This is why you read a lot of articles about the government's going to run out of money sometime in September or August when you know Congress has failed to pass a budget. That's what that's all about. Well, if the federal government doesn't pass a budget and set up its spending priorities, then all of the companies that pr pr provide services to the federal government don't get money. And so everyone grinds to a halt. That's what's going on there. But even so, every, every company has some sort of natural rhythm or natural cycle. Um, when I was at the university, the big push was to get everything done by the beginning of the fall semester, which meant you could plan your projects backwards. Everyone has to be, has to be trained on the software by the end of August which means the software has to be ready for training in July, which means the software has to be tested and installed by the end of June, which means the software has to be installed sometime in May and developed in you know, the, the first half of the year. You could set your watch by it. It was fantastic. Um, other companies are a little bit different, um, and some companies that are very large, they have multiple different cycles within the company. Um, the sales and marketing people at Amgen ran on a different cycle than the finance people who ran on the annual budget cycle. The sales and marketing people ran on a cycle which had to do with a big pharma conference, which I think happened in May. If you're in IT, if you're in technology and doing computer support, you know that, yeah, everybody gets two weeks off at Christmas, and that's your window for repairing all of the machines that they broke during the last three months. So that's... That's something to watch out for when you join a firm. What is the firm's natural cycle? The other thing um, I wanna stress here is when you are at a firm, when you are in the workplace, there's no school-like cycle of you know, a semester and then you stop and then you, know, you have a break. That doesn't happen. It's just you finish one project and you start immediately working on the next project. And then you do the next thing, and then you do the next thing, and then you do the next thing. And that's um, a little surprising, I think, for a lot of people who are coming right out of, a, uh, out of school into the workforce. There's not really a pause. And the other thing is that you're working on a set of, of things which are all pretty much the same. You don't get a different class, right? You don't switch from taking econ to, you know, to taking linear algebra or something like that. You know, you are pretty much the guy who's responsible for this particular piece of work. And you're going to be working on that thing for some time. And that thing has a number of different components or a number of different phases. And that's how it goes. You just keep working on that particular piece until the entire project is done or uh, you move into a different position or, you, or the company chooses to do something else. Um, and so with that, I would like you to, when you do your interview, you do want to ask, take the opportunity to ask, okay, what is the company's work cycle? You know, what does the work year look like here? When are you busiest? When are you least busy for, you know, the job that I'm working in? You know, how do you push people through? And, and you'd be surprised at how responsive a hiring manager will be to that. It's like, oh, this person is serious about doing the job and being available, you know, when we need them to be most available. Leaving. Um, I've left several jobs, you know, uh, it happens. I've had jobs leave me. 
Um, but um, how you leave a job depends in many regards under labor law. The labor law I'm most familiar with is California. California is an at-will state. Either party can leave um, at any time. The employer could say, thank you very much, see you later. You could say, thank you very much, see you later. Um, this is great. When I was working at a small company who had a division in, in uh, Hamburg, Germany, I was shocked to learn that their employees couldn't just quit and get another job because the one person I was talking to was clearly unhappy with what he was doing. He says, well, why don't you just quit and get another job? And he says, I can't because I have to fill, fulfill the terms of my contract. Oh, okay. Um, in the United States, generally the only people who have employment contracts are very highly placed employees at the VP, very, the very senior level, senior directors, VPs and above. Uh, so it's, un, it's, it was unusual to, for me to find out that an ordinary employee in Germany had to, had to continue to work at a job he disliked because he, he had to fulfill his employment contract. You don't have to do that in the state of California. You can go whenever you want to. Um, you, you could be, as I mentioned earlier, you could be let go for cause. I don't want to get into that because... A lot of it has to do with uh, legal arguments about whether or not your, your employment is working out or not. And I have a slide to talk about that a little bit later as well. But the key thing is that in California, which is an at-will state, either party, employer or employee, can leave at any time, can, can just say, I'm done, I'm moving on. Which leads me to this final bit about firms and positions. Firms will downsize. Firms will, will do layoffs. I have laid people off in my career. Um, I have terminated people for cause and I have laid them off. When you lay people off, it's not, if you get laid off, it's not your fault. Okay. The company's making a different decision. You know, all those managers and that pyramid thing that I, I drew earlier. Uh, they have made in a, a conscious decision to spend their scarce capital, the money that they have to invest in the business in a different direction. And this happens. Um, Amgen, for example, built up an entire team to do to attack a particular problem in cancer because they thought they could make money selling a particular kind of drug into this particular cancer market. And they went absolutely nowhere and they spent a lot of money over five years. And then they said, nope, we're not doing that anymore. They canceled the project, they removed the budget, and 100 people were let go because they were no longer required. Um, most of those people were support people, but a lot of them were highly placed PhD MD researchers whose specialties were in that particular disease. It's just how it happens. Um, industries change. Sometimes, you know, you, you lose money uh, and you can't make a go of it. One thing that an employer must do is that an employer entering a pay period must have enough cash on hand to pay the employees for that period. That's a legal requirement insofar as I know. And you can't literally, you can't enter a pay period without having that money. So if, if the company's looking at, oh man, I may not be able to pay everybody, you know, in six months, they're gonna let a bunch of people go and then keep some of their core people. This is not a reflection of you. This is a reflection of the financial duress the company is under, the firm is under. Same thing applies to the public, the, the you know, state employees, public sector, you know, they may not get their budget approved by the state or they may have their budget cut back and they have to let people go. It's not a reflection on you. It's just the way of the world. Um, and you should be paying attention to how your company is doing by reading the newspapers or how the government function or, or university you're working at is doing in terms of its revenue, and that'll give you a heads up. It won't be a surprise then. Generally, things will go along okay, but you do need to keep your, your eye out and your ear to the ground just to see how things are going as you work for any firm, in any business, in any segment of the market. Now, let's, let me switch this up. Um, when you work at a company, the work you do for that company is typically known as work for hire, which means any work product that you produce is the company's product. Um, this is not like being at school where you sort of own your test or, or your essay or whatever have you, 
on, and I've seen many cases when I was working at the university where people were developing things internally, and then they were trying to take them out to the marketplace. When you work at a firm, even at a university, even in graduate school or something like that, anything that you come up with is the property of the company. Um, and at one point in time, I talked to somebody who worked at IBM, and it was such that when you signed your employment agreement with IBM, not only was anything that you thought of and did on the job their property, but anything that you thought of that was related to your job when you were not on the clock was their property. And moreover, anything that you thought up up to six months or a year after you had left IBM was their property. They were very, very interested in keeping a hold of their intellectual property. Um, there are enormous numbers of things which are company proprietary, which you may not have considered. Um, and that goes right down to any kind of data or any kind of information that you even get close to touching. Things like a, a customer list is, is proprietary because it takes the company money, time, and energy to build a list of customers. You know, the internal employee directory is very sensitive information because that can be used by hackers to get into the company and it can be used by recruiters to go poach employees from the company. So even the employee directory is effectively uh, company proprietary information. Don't take anything that belongs to the company. Never ever do that because the company can come after you if you do that. You are entrusted to work with the company's information and systems and to treat them as the company's property. And if you don't do that, you can become um, in, enmeshed in an employment dispute with your employer. Um, the other thing I wanna stress, and I have actually a funny story about this, don't use the company's resources to access non-company services. I had, a, I had a group of people who were based in Switzerland um, and they were at the end of a very thin internet wire and they couldn't understand why they couldn't transfer their data. Well, it was because one employee, I'm being polite here, I, I'm, I'll just say idiot, had decided that they wanted to stream music and watch videos, and there wasn't sufficient bandwidth to support that and be able to do these big file transfers at the same time. So we put a stop to that, okay? So don't use the company's resources as your own entertainment. Um, the rules have, have somewhat changed because bandwidth is cheaper now, and it depends upon your, your employer's policies. They will set a policy. But in general, don't use, don't use non-company services and don't take advantage of the company's services for your own personal entertainment or your own personal your own personal effort because if you build it or do it on the company's equipment the company has a right to it so even if you you know let's say you're writing you know the story of my life or the great american novel and you're doing it on company equipment it's the company's so just don't do that do that on different equipment do it elsewhere and don't do it on company time um, the last point I want to make is that there is no real expectation of privacy in the workplace. I mean, they, they're not putting cameras in the bathrooms. But if you're in the workplace, um, you don't really have an expectation of privacy. So the things that you say um, to other people can be reported. Uh, they can be talked about with other people. Um, and effectively, you know, if, if you're going to go around bad-mouthing people at work, it's not going to go well. So don't, don't even do that if you are angry with somebody and you you're, you have a friend at work and you're doing that kind of thing, save it for after work. Just don't do it in the workplace where it can be overheard. Are there any questions on this point? It's really important to understand that the company's resources are not yours and that you're entrusted to use them wisely for the benefit of the company, not for yourself. I mean, this is, this is something that I think a lot of people, especially nowadays with the bring your own device movement, uh, don't really grasp. So are there any questions about this point? Okay. What about, uh, what about using accounts, like personal accounts and logging into company devices? I wouldn't use a personal account to log into a company device. I wouldn't log into my personal, my personal email or anything from inside a company device. The reason for that is once the data transits the company's network or goes through their gateway, it's probably being logged 
Um, so don't do that either. I mean, unless, unless it's really important, an emergency situation, I would not routinely access my personal accounts, you know, not my Spotify, not my email, you know, not even my LinkedIn on company time. Remember, you're on the company's, you're on the company's time, which means you're on the company's dime. And uh, save that for after work if you can. Carl, Darren, I, I do have uh, one comment. Um, also, don't use uh, personal devices for to log on to company accounts unless there's a very clear policy to do so. Yes, um, I, I was my exact next slide. <laughs> All right, go for it. <laughs> All right. So this is this is a big one. Um, one one of the groups that I was in charge of was in charge of uh, security at the company, and just just don't 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 use your personal devices um, to do company business. And the reason for this is to protect yourself. Um, number one, you don't want the company to take advantage of something that they're not paying for, right? The company should be paying for these services. The the other problem is that if you have company information on your personal device and the company gets into a legal situation, well, guess what? Now your device can be submitted for discovery in legal action and they will come through your phone to look for whatever files that you may have that have to do with the company. And oh, by the way, they get to look at all of your pictures and all of your other stuff that's in the phone. Um, so just don't use a, pro a personal device or any personal services to do company businesses. I had a company try to convince me to park money for them in one of my accounts. I'm like, dude, that's fraud. We're not doing that. Um, this, this is just a seriously bad idea. So my, my counsel here is draw a very, very bright, hard line between what's yours and what's the company's. Um, my daughter was was told to use her phone for company business at, at a company that she was working for. It was a healthcare company. I said, nope, it's not, especially not for healthcare because healthcare companies get sued all the time. You absolutely do not want to let the lawyers into your phone. And I don't care what you have on your phone. I don't need to see it. I just know that that should be private to you. And I told her to tell that to her boss. And guess what? They issued her a phone. And so she had two phones, a work phone and a private phone. And that's the way it should be. Um, likewise, if your phone uses, say, Wi-Fi communications to do Wi-Fi dialing, if you're making that phone call and using the company's Wi-Fi network, yeah, that's kind of a bad idea because now your data is traversing their network. So you have to think through this stuff um, very carefully. Um, just in general, just make sure as, as far as you can never to use anything um, that has to do with the company and keep your... Uh, for personal business and to keep your personal stuff separate entirely from the company stuff. This goes doubly so if you work in a high risk industry like defense um, or pharmaceuticals or healthcare or anything where people will sue at a drop of a hat or, or come after you. You just absolutely do not want to do that. Um, and it does depend upon the firm and they, and they may or may not have rules that you can follow. But my, my general advice is even with their rules is just never ever use your private stuff to do company business. It's just a bad idea. Okay, so we are working along and we decide that we don't like our job and the job changed. Uh, and you know, you were hired in to do one thing and you end up doing something else and it's not really what you wanted. Okay, that happens. Sometimes you you know you want to review the job description and the responsibilities that you signed up for, especially when first when you first come on board and say, okay, this is in my job description. This is what I'm going to do. Companies will treat job descriptions more as guidelines. There's a famous a famous line that shows up in the job description, which is typically and other duties as assigned. But if your job description is so far out. If, if the job they're, they're asking you to do is so far out of your skill set and what you signed on to do, you don't necessarily have to do it. You can quit um, or you can talk to your manager about it. Um, I started a job at one company and I hired on as a project manager 
product manager, sorry, not project manager. And then they put me in charge of the help desk and I quit. I gave two weeks notice. I did not want to work as the help desk manager. I didn't want to have to contend with the customers. I had hired on very specifically to do a very specific task, which was improve their software. And sitting on the help desk and babysitting my help desk employees was taking all of my time and I didn't care for it. So I just quit, you know, uh, these things happen. Sometimes, you know, you, you get into a situation in a company where it's just not working out. So you can look for another job in the company or you can look for another job elsewhere. It's not a big deal. Um, it's simply the fact that, you know, sometimes uh, companies need you to do different things. And if it's not something that you enjoy doing, you don't have to. Um, there's plenty of work out there and I'll get into that um, a little bit later. And here we are at that exact point. Here's the thing. Right now in the United States, there is a, what's known as um, structural problems. There's a huge labor shortage, especially for skilled labor. So this is actually a golden opportunity, especially if you're in tech and you're moving into the workforce coming out of school. The reason why there's a structural labor shortage is because there's not enough people in this country who are of early working, early career stage, which is say age 20 to 35. Um, there weren't enough babies born and it takes 20 years to take a baby and turn it into a productive human being. And because not a whole lot of babies were born right around the turn of the millennium, we now have a very short supply of new work, which is why you're seeing in some regards labor unrest and uh, uh, wage inflation in the workplace. This is very similar to the situation I grew up under in the 1970s, although that was uh, monetary inflation caused by the Johnson administration, the Vietnam War. Similar things are going on now here, but it's being compounded by the fact that there just aren't enough skilled people working in the workforce, which is great if you're coming in from outside the company or on an H-1B or something like that. Um, we are, the United States is desperate for people to do, uh, to supply labor to all of those giant open positions. Um, the other thing is because the United States as a labor market is very flexible, you know, some of that is that, that at will business uh, and the, you can change jobs very quickly and very readily. It's very easy to start up a company and it's very easy to find interesting companies that have been started. Um, most of the time you can find somebody who's looking for, you know, a problem to solve. And, you know, you can, if you can figure out how to make money at it, it's a business and off you go, right? Um, one of the problems that, that cropped up about five or six years ago was the fact that, you know, I just want to watch a TV show. Where is it playing? Is it on Netflix, Hulu, Showtime, HBO? I don't know. Prime, uh, you know, there's dozens and dozens of services. So a company came together called Just Watch and they built out a little app which scrapes the data from all of these services and lets you know where you can go find a particular show to watch. Um, this is very similar to an old service, which was called TV Guide, which printed the listings of all the shows on broadcast television back in the day. I don't even know if the TV Guide is still around anymore, but Just Watch is the modern equivalent. Somebody came up with a business thing and then they had to hire people into the positions they needed to build their app and scrape their data and run the company. So this stuff happens. Um, we're in a golden age for workers right now. So take advantage of that. <clears throat> And so when you take advantage of it, uh, it, when you're in the workforce, I want you to consider yourself that you're a business of one, that you are a person who is selling their services to the highest bidder. Um, when you have a sink, when you're, what you have with your employer, remember, it's the customer who pays. Remember I said that earlier? Well, your employer is paying you. So in many regards, your employer is a customer. And what the, the thing to do is you got to make the customer happy. And if you make the customer happy, the customer will keep coming back for more. That's pretty much how it works. Um, are these French fries cold? Yes, I'm not buying my French fries at this particular store anymore. You know, uh, if, are these French fries hot, crispy, and salty? Yes, I will always buy these French fries. Um, it works exactly the same in the employment world. 
You're, you're a business of one and you have sold your time and energy, which is the product that you offer to your employer who pays you. That makes the customer the employer. And that makes you the person who is in some regards in charge of the relationship far more than the employer. Um, I've been self-employed. I've tried being self-employed. I've run my own startup business. I had a side business when I was working at the University of Southern California. That's a lot of fun. But you spend an enormous amount of time and energy uh, trying to find new business. The amount of work you actually do, for example, you know, I, I enjoy writing software. The amount of energy that I would spend writing software was, was dwarfed by the amount of time and energy I spent trying to find new customers. And then once you get a new customer, you have to get them, you have to do the work, and then you have to get them to pay you. Sometimes they don't pay you in a timely fashion. And then you have all these other things that you have to take care of. For example, uh, one of the things, one of the reasons why I stopped running the consulting business was I couldn't get errors and omissions, something called errors and omissions insurance. If you make a mistake, you don't want the, the consultant, the people that you're consulting with to sue you. So you have to carry insurance. And normally insurance for errors and omissions in the software industries is pretty low. It's only a few hundred dollars a year. But if you tell them that, you know, my clients are in the healthcare industry, they won't touch you with a 10 foot pole because the healthcare industry or pharmaceutical industry is very risky because everyone knows they want to sue big pharma and then big pharma is going to turn around and they'll sue you. So that was the end of that business. Um, the other interesting point is this kind of this, this business of one and the fact that you organize people together is one of the reasons why there are firms. Um, there's, a, there's a footnote here about uh, Ronald Coase and his important Nobel Prize winning work. Um, he pointed out that the reason why people form companies is that, yeah, sure, you could go out and you could coordinate all of these different independent contractors and vendors to get something done. But the amount of time and overhead involved in doing that is enormous. And the result is that you have less time to do the actual thing that you're doing, the product that you're making or the service you're providing for which you get paid because work that is done to organize work is really kind of dead, dead time, right? A uh, good example, let's say you own a truck and you, and, you, you own, and you drag freight around. Well, if you drive your truck full of freight, you get paid for that. But if you have to drive it back empty, that's called deadheading in the trunk, trucking industry because you're not getting paid to haul your empty truck back to where you can pick up the next load, which is why trucks going around the country, they try to pick up loads in individual cities and go from city to city to city because they wanna get paid for every leg of the, of the drive. Um, same problem, same reason why you form a firm. You want everybody to be focused on doing the work and less time and energy spent on organizing things and finding people to do the work for you. So this is a, this is a big advantage. What does that mean? Well, it means that your employer is very interested in keeping a hold of you. It's, it's very costly to hire someone into a position at a firm, typically 25 to 30% of their first year salary when you figure in all of the time and, and overhead and pain and uh, opportunity cost losses. So they're very interested in retaining an employee once an employee is in. And this goes for whether or not you're actually directly employed by the company or employed through a contracting agency. Um, so they will offer additional benefits. And my recommendation to you is to take all the money, take all the benefits, take the matching 401k. It's free money. It's just sitting on the table. Never leave money lying on the table. If they offer you, um, you know, beyond a healthcare benefit, um, if they offer you stock, if they offer you, uh, I don't know, if they offer you a, uh, you know, free travels to places, if they offer you tuition, if they offer you membership and things like the IEEE, go ahead and take it. Um, the companies are delighted to spend small amounts of money. Well, 401ks are not small, but they, they're delighted to spend small amounts of money to make their employees happy. And if you can use the benefits to forward your own career and your own knowledge, then go ahead and take that stuff as, as best as you can. So, in brief, 
A firm is someone who makes a good or a service and supplies it to the marketplace and they get paid and the, the payment derives what the firm is and the nature of the firm because you're dealing with a different kind of customer. The people who buy steel are, the different, are different than the people who buy, say, cotton cloth, okay? So very important to pay attention to what the firm's line of business is. You want to make sure that people coming into the positions the firm has will do the work and do work out with the team. That's very important. Um, you'll see a lot of team building exercises and other things to get everybody to go along and work together. If you're generally pleasant, you'll fit right in. Um, you want to make sure that you keep the firm's information and the firm's systems and services separate from your own so that there's no confusion about where something is or what something is. And then if there's any issue with your employer, you can say, nope, I don't have that information. I don't know what happened to it. Um, it's not on my phone. I didn't, I didn't lose it. Um, and then the other thing is to treat your employer as your customer uh, and that you're a business of one and that will help you understand your relationship with them and that will help them feel good about you because you're supplying them with the best possible uh, customer experience. Um, and that's pretty much the, the, the top line points. I have a series of resources I can go through and share with you, um, but are there any questions at this time that I could answer? I don't see any in the chat either. Okay, well then we'll, I'll just, I'll just click through these pretty quickly. Um, key resource to own, if you don't have a passport, you should probably get one. Um, this is incredibly useful for, for travel, both within the United States and leaving the United States. If you have a passport, the company can send you overseas. Um, and one of the nice things about traveling overseas is that you get to see kind of really interesting different things. And if you're paying attention, you know, it's like a free, it's not really a vacation, but you know, as the saying goes, travel broadens the mind, but you need a passport to do that. The other nice thing about a passport is because it's a firm piece of identification, um, you could show that when you're filling out an I-9 during your employment process. Um, very handy to have a solid piece of identification. I have a passport, I keep it up to date. Um, the passports are now coming with an extra small fee with a little um, thing that looks like a driver's license card. So you don't have to take your passport when you go to the airport. You just show that card to TSA and it's like right this way, sir. Um, so it's, it's worth it to have a passport. They don't cost that much. I highly recommend it. Um, Tyler says, what advice do you have for new grad students? Uh, well, it would depend upon what grad area you're in. For graduate students, I think, I think the, the major difference here is um, getting used to the difference between what's, what the employer's work cycle is versus what the graduate student um, annual um, business cycle is within uh, your, your school or your company. Um, I think that was the biggest, the biggest concern I had from the grad students that I was talking to when I was at that event a few weeks, I guess about six weeks ago now. Um, very, maybe it was closer to two months. They were very confused and they were apprehensive about what it would be like moving into the workplace. And it had to do with how they, how they were going to plan their day. Um, so it's the difference between having continuous work around, around a year um, according to the company cycle versus some sort of continuous or semi-continuous work that you may have in grad school. And um, the shift away from the academic calendar year into the business year. Did that help? Tyler? For an undergraduate, some of the, some of the same things for undergraduate. Um, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me address that a little bit further along. For an undergraduate, uh, a good thing is to take advantage of the employer's benefits for furthering your education on their dime, especially if they offer a tuition program. Um, you could seriously take advantage of that, uh, doing continuing education or doing certi certificated or certified training for various things. That would be, if you move into the workplace, I would do that. Um, uh, you know, there's a saying that was really popular in management about 20 years ago. It was called lifelong learning. Everyone should be involved in lifelong learning. Um, well, yeah, you know, 
you are going to be learning stuff your entire life. But if you focus on where, where, whether you could use it in your career, that's the best kind of lifelong learning. And, you know, again, I'll talk about that a little bit later. There's an upcoming slide. Okay. So get a passport. Um, I could, I could jump in a little bit. Um, so as, as somebody who has done a lot of hiring recently, not so much in software engineering, um, at least in kind of my field work, which is, I guess, uh, research and development, I guess you could say, um, having having projects to talk to as part of a resume is really valuable. Um, I tend to pass over candidates who are people who just filled out boxes, like they, they showed up to school, they did the work, they got the degree, they went home. Um, so... You know, internships are a really powerful way of speaking, not only to your skill sets, but also building professional references. Um, if you're having trouble getting internships, um, internships are incredibly cyclical, right? They, they tend to, most internship opportunities tend to show up in the summer um, or like late spring. Um, and so companies won't start recruiting for those until, oh, I don't know, March. Um, so in lieu of that, having personal projects or, or things that you can speak to that showcase your skill sets outside of just like, hey, I'm a recent graduate, um, is a very powerful way of getting beyond um, beyond the initial kind of screening. Great, thank you. The next the next recommendation I would have, and I, this book came out when I was halfway through my career. I found this tremendously helpful. Uh, in understanding my boss and understanding how the bosses think. It's mostly about finance. A lot of companies are run by people who understand only finance. They don't necessarily understand the line of business per se, um, but the, the MBAs who tend to run or end up running a lot of firms and sometimes running them into the ground, look at what happened to Intel when they hired a finance guy to be the CEO. Uh, now they're back to having a technical guy. Anyhow, so this book is actually probably worth your time. It's not 10 days, it's three weeks at least. Um, you can read it in the evening. The chapters are broken down basically by the coursework. So it'll help you understand what the boss is thinking or how the finance people inside your firm are thinking. And this, this doesn't apply so much to the private, to the uh, public sector in uh, you know, state uh, employment but um, they are operating under the similar sorts of uh, budget projections. The other thing that I found amusing about this book is, you know, as an engineer, as a computer scientist, you can see how the business people are trying to adopt the computer science terminology and, you know, like it's really cool and, and advanced thinking. And it's like, no, dude, you're, you're just drawing a decision tree. This is, this is not a big deal. I mean, we used to do this, you know, as a programming exercise. Yeah. Yeah, Agile. Agile. Oh, it's Agile. Yeah, there's a bunch of buzzwords in there. So enjoy the buzzwords if you get this book. The next book, uh, which I found very useful, I had I had an opportunity to get um, stock and through stock options through Amgen. I didn't understand anything about that. And this book was helpful to me because it helped me change my emotional relationship to uh, money. Um, the the key thing here is wealth is not money. Wealth is your ability to deal with problems in your life quickly, easily, and in reasonable comfort. Um, you know, if you're going to change jobs and you have six months of money or, or eight months of money in the bank to support, you know, you while you go look for a new position or new interesting things to do, you're going to be a lot less stressed about it than if you have to get a job right away in order to pay the rent. That's what money is for. Money is there to make your life comfortable and changing your attitude towards your money. Your money should be working for you as hard as you work for it. Actually, it should work harder. That's the whole point behind having wealth is that it works for you so you don't have to. This is a very good book. It's based on real estate. It might be a little out of vogue, but he's he writes it in a very humorous way, and it was very enjoyable for me and very helpful for me. Speaking of stock, um, I had to get this book in order to understand what to do, and then I educated myself about the stock markets and how to think about managing my uh, stock that I got from Amgen. Um, 
And it, this allowed me to find a, a good accountant. This allowed me to find a very good financial manager. And I would have long discussions with a financial manager. And because I'm an engineer, and because I think in terms of mathematics, and she was a, a business accounting person, you know, I would rattle off something and then she would stop and look at me and say, you know, I haven't thought about that since I was in school. But yeah, that's exactly how the math works. And it's like, yeah, it's it's arithmetic. So it's it's kind of useful to know how to think about managing your wealth going forward using the advantages that people who have stock and who know how the market works and what you can do if you're in the situation where the company offers you um, a stock option or an employee stock purchase plan, typically if, you're, if your company is a public company, one that's already IPO'd. Very helpful book, probably not for everyone, but if you get to that position, you definitely wanna take a look at, at having a copy of this book. The next resource that I highly recommend is that you read a good business-oriented newspaper. I personally subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. I have done so for years mainly because this is the paper that your boss will read or the fin and especially the finance people will read. The problem with newspapers is something down at the bottom there, which is called Gelman amnesia. And Gelman amnesia is named after Murray Gelman, the famous physicist who invented quantum chromodynamics. And it's a quote from uh, Michael Crichton, the famous author who wrote things like Jurassic Park and Terminal Man and uh, the Andromeda Strain. And I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read what uh, Michael Crichton said about Gelman amnesia because it's a very perfect statement. He says, "Briefly stated, the Gelman amnesia effect is as follows: You open the newspaper to an article in some subject that you know very well. In Murray's case, it's physics. In mine, it's show business. You read the article, and you see the journalist has absolutely no understanding." of either the facts or the issues. Often the article is so wrong, it actually presents the story backwards, reversing cause and effect. I call these the wet streets cause rain stories. The paper is absolutely full of them. In any case, you read with exasperation or amusement the multiple errors in the story. And then you turn the page to the national or international news and read it as if the rest of the newspaper was somehow more accurate <laughs> than the baloney you just read. You turn the page and you forget that you know that it's mostly junk. <laughs> um, the Wall Street Journal is considerably less junk because they're focused on money and then everything else is sort of subservient to that. It'll, you know, it's, it's worth trying to get a, a, a subscription on uh, you can get it as a student uh, for not much money, buy the annual subscription for not much money. You can read it online. I find it, uh, it was a little difficult for me to grasp at first, but having the 10 day MBA in hand helped. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very interesting newspaper. There's other similar news sources if you don't wanna pay for it, uh, but you know, look around, make sure that you're getting really good news and get, it, get your news from a number of different sources because everyone has got an angle basically. Um, this is a really interesting book. It's only been out for about 10 years. And what, what Scott Adams talks about is, well, I'm actually kind of a, kind of a screw up and I have all these different talents. How do I put all of this stuff together? How do I, how do I make a career for myself? What's, what's the best way to do this? And what he suggests is building something called a talent stack, um, where you take all the different pieces that fit together. Um, and the example I've, I've put here is, is Tesla company. If you think about Tesla as a company, it's a really interesting company. Everyone thinks, well, they're a car company. Well, no, not really. Okay. They're a battery company that makes cars. They're a solar company that makes batteries for houses. They have solar panels. And a lot of their lines of business fit together, and they fit together with other businesses, lines of, and other companies that are uh, lines of business for uh, Musk's X empire. For example, the metallurgy they learn in making cars um, can possibly be applied in some of their rocketry. One of the things that Tesla started doing recently is they figured out how to injection mold metal frame parts 
for the undercarriage of their cars. No one has done this before, which meant they had to work out how to make the metal work and flow into a mold. They had to formulate the metal. They had to get the metal to in the right formulation so that it would harden and it would fill the mold exactly and it would be a precision part. This is incredibly difficult. Once they figured that out, they could literally pump their cars out. They just spooge those parts out one every like minute. And it's far faster than manufacturing it by assembling it out of different pieces of cut metal. Um, so it's, it's that kind of knowledge that can be applied to other businesses and industries. Um, the key thing here is you have, you have a number of different talents and a number of different interests. Some of those work together and you can expand that set of talents and interests. And then you could look around and see how to apply that elsewhere. Um, and that's a lot of fun. You know, okay, I don't know anything about this. Maybe I need to get smart about X. And so I go and learn about XYZ subject. And I go, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. I can apply this over here. It's far more fun to do it that way rather than, you know, just say, well, I have got to take a class. You know, you don't have to take a class. There's tons of people on YouTube who will cheerfully tell everything you want to know about something. Uh, I also highly recommend that you, uh, you know, join the IEEE. Um, you can do it as a student for not much money. Um, there's fantastic benefits in terms of the publications that IEEE puts out. And it's not just technical stuff. It's like labor surveys and, you know, getting, getting a leg up on your um, a career path. Um, they offer career path courses and so forth. Um, IEEE is good. ACM is good, especially if you're going into uh, academia as a computer scientist. Uh, so I know people in the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, um, project managers, society and women and society of women in engineering is a good group to belong to um, because you know you can get a leg up that way. So the other thing about it is your employer may pay you for belonging to these groups. Um, take advantage of that. Um, you know, as I said, don't leave money on the table. And if they're willing to, you know, pay for your subscription to the IEEE or ACM or SWE, go ahead and do it. Um, you will meet a lot of interesting people and you will be able to uh, broaden your horizons. There's a lot of, you know, old guys like me standing around just dying to tell our stories. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this. Um, you're going to be working probably for the next 40 years. Don't, don't kill yourself. <laughs> You know, uh, I retired from, from Amgen at the age of 48 because I had a focus on building up my wealth so I could afford to retire. Uh, retire means you don't stop working. It just means you get to work on whatever the heck it is you want to work on, not what you have to work on. So if you focus on that as an idea, you know, how, how am I going to, you know, become my own my own person, uh, so I don't have to work necessarily. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting way to do it. Um, we did, we did pretty well. I mean, Amgen was very, very good to us. It was good to a lot of people. Um, you had to take advantage of it, and you had to know what you're doing. This goes back to the stock options thing. I met a guy whose badge number was seven, and this was like 30, 25 years after the company had been launched. I said. How come you're still working here? I mean, you got all these great, fabulous, enormous stock options when you started out. How come you're still working? What did you do with your stock options? And he said, well, I just cashed them out and then I bought stuff. And I said, so you have a $100,000 couch, right? And he said, yeah, pretty much. I didn't do that. I, you know, I saved and reinvested those things and they, they paid me back. I made my money work for me. You can do the same thing too. I started saving and, and investing the instant I entered the major workforce. I started taking advantage of those 401ks, you know, at the age of 22. You can do it too. Um, it's the best advice I ever got was from an, an uh, older gentleman named Howard Sapperston. He said, you got to understand you're young and you need to remember that the power of compound interest will only serve you best. 
you cannot lose if you take advantage of the power of compound interest. And I took that to heart and followed his advice, especially with the free money the company was willing to give me. I think they matched five and 10% in the 401ks at the time. So yeah, go ahead and take care of that. Um, your time is valuable, right? You, you have a life to live. You need to focus on work, you know, do the best you can at your job and, you know, but it's a job and you are taking care of your customer and your customer is paying you. And if you view it that way, you won't get too caught up in it to the point where it takes over your life. Um, I've seen people who literally worked themselves to death because they were so caught up in what they were doing. That's okay if you wanna be a startup founder or something like that, where the company is you and the company is your life. But if you're an average employee and you, you have other things that you would rather do, you know, you got to make a decision here. Um, just serve your customer as best you can, be your business of one, and, you know, focus on your family, focus on your friends, focus on, you know, whatever goals you like, whatever things that you, that you are interested in, um, and do that, right? Don't, don't let your work life completely take over. Uh, let, let, let me put it another way. I, I got this tip recently. It's like most people live about 4,000, maybe 4,200 weeks. By the time you're out of undergraduate school, let's say the age of 22, you've already used up 1,150 of those weeks. You know, how many more weeks are you going to spend? Um, a work year is about 200 days of valuable work. And of that, maybe only half I found that, you know, by monitoring myself and keeping track of what I could do and how productive I am, I'm, you know, I could put in about, you know, four to six hours of solid work during the day. I and mean, the rest of it was just sitting in meetings being bored. Um, if you can maximize the amount of time you produce valuable work, you, you will go, you will go very far. Um, and you have to be careful with other people's time as well as your own time of this little presentation. This presentation took me and I had a couple of people look at it for me, you know, and make suggestions and, and changes and, and some additions too. You know, I added it all up because, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd. I like keeping track of things. It cost about 15 to 20 hours of work. So, you know, yeah, it's only 29 slides, but if you break that down, it's about, you know, what's 29 divided by 20, right? It's, 20 hours divided by 29, that's what, 45, 50 minutes per, per slide to produce this for a presentation. And I'm taking up your time right now, your valuable time, yakking at you through the camera. And with that, I would like to say, are there any final questions? Carl, I will chime in with a, a comment while people are thinking of questions. Um, you did mention one thing about, uh, you know, speaking slowly earlier on. Um, I did have a manager once who accused me of trying to filter my responses. And I had to really explain to him that, no, that's not what I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to be as accurate as possible. Yeah, which is a kind of filtering to be certain. Which is um, a kind of filtering, but it isn't, uh, it, it isn't, uh, I, I, I'm, tr I'm not trying not to just say the first thing that comes to mind because yeah. I, I discovered I discovered at one point that people would sometimes listen to me and take me seriously and go off and do stuff and I was like why are you doing that it's like you said so it's like oh, it's just <laughs> it's just off the top of my head <laughs> yeah uh I, I've got that the other the other thing is I mean there's a whole branch of psycholinguistics you could read up on and how people respond to language a really good case in point of a criminal use of language was uh, uh, what was that startup um, where the lady was defrauding people? Uh, um, uh, Theranos. Theranos, right? Yeah. So Elizabeth Holmes was the CEO, and she was a, a very attractive blonde-haired woman, which is always good for the investors. But her normal speaking voice was, you know, a standard high speaking voice of a of an adult female woman. But when she talked to the investors or gave an interview, she dropped the pitch of her register and she tilted her head down and stared directly into the camera without, oh, I'm sorry, stared directly into the eyes of the people she was speaking to. And she practiced not blinking. 
And she said this, and she said she learned this trick from Steve Jobs. I've seen Steve Jobs speak in person and those slick sales presentations, he gave one when I was at the university when he was trying to bring out his next computer. And he spent the entire day before he was due to present in the auditorium where he was going to present practicing. So what you see is not necessarily the real thing. What you're often seeing is a show. And you need to be aware, guys, of when you're being shown a show. And I, I can't tell you how to, how to figure it out. You just have to, you have to experience seeing people put on the show and work through that. Um, so it's kind of a superpower once you can see people do that in the workplace. Any other questions or comments? Speak up, folks. You should all be able to unmute. So there's four chats. Going once, going twice. Well, I think that's a wrap. Unless, uh, unless somebody right. is, uh, is uh, typing furiously in, in the chat, uh, but uh, I think you might be right. Okay. Well, thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you're entirely you. welcome. Um, thank you guys for turning up and uh, listening to an old man rattle on and on. Oh, wait, <laughs> we can always learn something new. I learned something new, too. Oh, definitely. Uh, pick up a couple of those books I haven't read yet. Um, thank you very much. Just you're Go welcome, ahead. Kenji. Thank you. Oh, hey. And you're welcome, Jasmine and Tyler. Or Yasmin, sorry. Cool. And, and uh, Is that any relation to um, <laughs> the Warner Brothers and the Warner Sister there? <laughs> don't know. Anyways, with uh, wrapping this up, um, just a, a reminder again, there's our mixer tomorrow over in Westlake. Um, all the details are on our IEEE website. You can easily just Google it, IEEE BV, and you'll be popped into the Buena Ventura website. And uh, if you're interested, uh, we'd like to see you. Um, and thank you again, Carl, for, for doing that presentation. You're okay. welcome. I, I believe we, we can make the slides available. Uh, they're just in uh, Google. So I, I don't know how you want to do that, guys, but we can do that as well. Okay. Yeah, I can uh, I can take that on. All right. Thanks, Darren. All right. All right, guys. Have a great evening and uh, have a great careers, you know, if I don't see you. Um, good right. luck. And, and keep in touch with our IEEE. I'm sure you'll get the emails, but uh, there's many different technical seminars that and webinars that we do, uh, some of which you might find very interesting. Um, and look forward to seeing you guys all again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>